Hello, Insatiable listeners. Season six is now complete. We are on a break in between seasons. I'll return on Wednesday, February 13th with a new theme and a big surprise. I can't wait to share it with you. I am so bad at surprises. So let's just say that if you love the type of conversations we have here, rabbit holes and experimenting, you're going to love it. In the meantime, enjoy these podcast interviews I've done recently. There are quite a range of topics, but hey, you know that's how we roll here. And there will be a few classic episodes leading up to season seven that will help you get the most out of the season and a clue about the theme. Also, if you enjoy the show or have benefited from it, I'd so appreciate a review. You guys totally rallied this summer to get us to over 100. We're currently at 105, and I would love for us to get to 150 by spring. It really helps the show as it makes it easier for others to find it. And I'd like to read two recent reviews. This one from Insatiable Listener, and her review or his was more smash the part patriarchy than light and love. If you want trite, simplistic solutions to health and wellness, this is not the podcast for you. You won't find bad diets or tidy Instagrammable quotes, but that's why it's amazing. Allie has a gift for interviewing that brings out her subject's authentic wisdom. It's perfect if you're curious about how to be healthier in all senses of the word, appreciate the nuance and complexity of our unique bodies, or if you just want to hear smart people talking to each other about how to navigate and destroy cultural systems and reassess our culture our collective values. Thank you so much for that uh, five-star review, insatiable listener. (laughs) Love that you're into uh, reassessing our collective values. And another one that I'll share from Design Lover 757997. Nuance, smart, and sassy too is the title of her five-star review. She says, I'm exhausted of the constant unhealthy messages that barrage us everywhere from Instagram feeds. Seriously, those people with the super round butts they don't tell you it's implants, to our diet culture in general. Insatiable is my personal weapon of resistance against those messages. It's balanced, intelligent, and Ali, the host of the podcast, brings in some of the most interesting people I've heard in podcast interviews. Look, if you want to break free from rigid rules but still live a healthy and balanced life, Insatiable can help you carve out your own path. No rules, no dogma, just thoughtful new ways of seeing and being in the world. Thank you so much, Design Lover 757997. And I'll be reading some more <laughs> uh, in, an up, in some upcoming episodes. If you have time or, again, have benefited from the podcast, here's how you can leave a review. You launch Apple's podcast app. You tap the search tab and you enter the name of the podcast you want to rate or review. In this case, Insatiable. Tap the blue search key at the bottom right. Tap the album art for the podcast tap the reviews tab, and then tap write a review at the bottom. And if you don't have time for that, if you could just rate it, how many stars you would rate it. That is also super helpful as well. And thank you for being a listener. Having stimulating conversations is what I most treasure in my life. And I get to have them here. And then with you on Instagram, where I connect with so many of you through your emails and and also with our guests. It's a joy I cherish deeply. Look forward to seeing you back here in a couple of weeks for new episodes on Wednesday, February 13th. And in the meantime, enjoy these recent interviews and classic episodes. When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce With Food program and your host for Insatiable where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 3 of Insatiable, Oprah's 60-Minute Discovery Applied to Body Image and Eating. A couple months ago, Oprah did a piece on 60 Minutes that was life-changing for her where she examined the effects of trauma 
she didn't relate it to the body image and eating world, but it was very much a thread that is in our eating and body image challenges. And so I wanted to have Rebecca Ching on today, who has been a longtime friend, colleague of mine. She is a therapist and a speaker, a writer, and a leadership consultant who has a brick and mortar therapy, integrated holistic therapy uh, center in San Diego, California. But she really understands trauma from so many different perspectives, from EMDR to cognitive to inner family systems, which is basically to say she, she's got a lot of different lenses that she looks at it through. So I really wanted to have her on today so that those of you who are struggling with you know keeping up healthy habits, whatever they are, can maybe see why, that it's really you're not broken um, and you don't need to be fixed. Maybe you just haven't had the right approach. So today we're going to talk with Rebecca about what exactly is trauma and how so many people think it doesn't relate to them, but it does, and how it's not really what happens to you, but about this key thing about your body and your system. We also discuss about how wanting to, quote, just move on from challenging things isn't possible. You may try to do it, but there's going to be some residue <laughs> and body, uh, and the body holds, right? The body keeps the score, as Vander Cook says. And lastly, we're going to really get into, and this was a hugely helpful for me. She gave me language that I didn't have previously about the difference between being victimized and a victim mindset. And this is really going to be helpful for those of you who, you know, want to take charge of, of your life and your health and issues, yet have to really explore the pain rather than unattach it. And we'll get into <laughs> why I've never really resonated with Tony Robbins' work, even though I know he's helped a lot of people, so I don't want to dismiss that. Um, but we get into one of the nuanced disconnects when it comes to trauma um, and how sometimes his work can keep people stuck. So that was really helpful for me. And I hope for those of you who maybe have found those type of approaches in the personal development world ineffective for you, you might discover why today. So enjoy today's episode. And also just a reminder on my brand new website, there's a quiz. What's your comfort eating style? You can take that at Ali Shapiro dot com and get some insights, especially related to today's episode, trauma births in certain patterns that are very protective. And you can learn some of those patterns by taking the quiz. So check that out again at alishapiro.com. Enjoy today's episode. So I am here with Rebecca Bass Ching, and I am so excited for you guys to listen to this episode today. Rebecca and I have known each other for quite some time, and she's the real deal. Part of the reason that instigated this episode is a bunch of my clients, I encourage them to watch Oprah's 60-minute piece on trauma. Oprah went to a town in Wisconsin, and it was this life-changing piece for her of realizing that a lot of the reasons that people have trouble holding jobs or that they have trouble with alcoholism is that it's basically unresolved trauma. And Oprah did this amazing piece on it, and they talked about how People can move through trauma if they have one person who's really advocates for them um, and how it has changed everything, how she's approached her foundation, her nonprofits, the question of not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And so I was thrilled to see this, but then at the same time, and at the same time, you know, Oprah is a, a stakeholder in Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers is also rolling out free memberships to teenagers, which for a lot of my clients and I'm sure Rebecca's clients, myself included, we started Weight Watchers around 11 or in our teenagers and it set up this huge cycle of disordered eating when really a lot of disordered eating, and we're going to get into exactly what that is, is unresolved trauma. And I felt like it was this huge disconnect. And, and not that the 60-minute piece had to <laughs> capture everything, but I wanted to have Rebecca on today as someone who works with trauma, who has worked with Brene's Brown work around vulnerability in the daring way. Rebecca, for you really to help us flush out and make this connection between body image and eating disorders and unresolved trauma. So thank you so much for willing to come on and chat about this. Thank you, Allie. Thank you for having me. And I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. So... Let's first start by defining trauma because what I've experienced in my work, and I'm sure you have with your clients and, and in your practice with other therapists, is people tend to think trauma is something that happens to other people. 
or when they've had, you know, come, been raised in a divorced family or with not a lot of financial support and I'm thinking, or have been bullied and marginalized. They mm-hmm. tend to think like, well, I'm over that and I've moved on and, and it's not, I'm not coming from a war refuge, you know, a war torn country or some of my clients like, I didn't have cancer like you. And I'm like, no, it's, this isn't like a competition of how bad a trauma is. So how mm-hmm. do you define trauma? And let's start there. Yeah, great question. And you're right. When you say the word trauma, it often evokes either this image of like early childhood abuse or someone who got in like a car accident or was in a plane crash. It's like those more extreme experiences. And obviously those things are traumatic. But what we, we, we talk about trauma also as difficult life experiences because it helps people kind of get their get their brains around it a little bit more. But traumas are those experiences that are, whether they're little dings or leveling dings, but they cause some distress emotionally and physically on our bodies. And so like a little trauma, and I want to make sure when I use like a little trauma, it's not like it's small and insignificant, but little traumas are ones that we experience and we don't really say what it is because it could be everyone gets hit differently with different things, would be something that stings and causes emotion, physical, emotional response, but they still can move on. You can still function, show up at school or at work and in your relationships. And after a while, unresolved these like little dings they start to burden the system. And then the larger traumas, again, it it can vary. It's not about what it is, it's how your system receives it. And these are the ones that keep us from going to work and practicing hygiene and feeding well and, and relating well. And so what's been really powerful is to educate people that it really isn't the event that we analyze, it's more of how our system experiences it. So someone who experiences the world and feels deeply or someone who has a genetic hardwiring to be, you know, that's highly perfectionistic or has a strong obsessive compulsive tendencies in their hardwiring of personality may experience things like not getting an A plus or not scoring the winning goal or a relationship breakup that might hit their system a lot differently than other, the other things. But one of the other foundational pieces that Oprah's piece touched on is kind of this element of relationships and who in your life are, we're hardwired to need and want our parents. And when something's disruptive and disrupted in that, and we don't have another person to attach to and kind of have ourselves reflected back to, that can also be disorienting. And so how we even engage in the world. So that's why you hear folks who've been through some things that really like shake us when we hear the stories, but they are thriving and doing well. A lot of it is because of their ability to have other mentors or key relationships in their lives or their ability to connect with themselves and their own story. And so what was interesting about the Oprah piece, just to jump back to that, she quoted an ACE study. And for her, this was new information. And I just want to make sure your audience understands the ACE study is over 20 years old and it was done. Um, it's a Kaiser Permanente Center for Disease and Control joint study that they did between 95 and 97. So in the trauma treatment world, this is like, like no, this is foundational. This is 101 stuff. So it just shows the the chasm there is in really understanding trauma. So your audience can Google ACE. There's some tests people can take and get a sense of where they land on that. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you reminded me. We've talked about that because actually, you know, the ACE scores came out of an obesity clinic in your neck of the woods in San Diego. Yep, and the Kaiser. Yeah, yeah. They thought they were understanding, studying obesity and they're like, whoa, these people don't want to be visible as they started to lose weight. Yes. And so, so anyway, so trauma is really difficult life experiences. And then to circle back to really, our brain is amazing. Our body is amazing. I know you talk about that a lot too, and it's so wise. And so like, if we get a cut on our arm, right, we get a scratch, the body's natural healing way will be to kind of scab it up and eventually it'll kind of float away. Maybe it'll be a little scar, maybe not. But if some sand or dirt got into that wound, the scab would have a hard time healing and it would get infected. So the same thing happens with our brain's memory network system. And so it it flushes through uh, when we have a difficult experience on that trauma spectrum. And if something gets in the way and that that difficult material doesn't get flushed through, it gets stuck there, then our brains and our bodies get frozen in time. And so if a sound or a smell or a touch or something we see reminds our brain of that, it will respond as if it's in that moment. 
and not, and, and so that's why people are like, why am I freaking out over something that's so small? Or why is this still lingering? I thought I worked on this. And so often that's a sign that just the brain needs some extra help and the body needs some extra help to kind of help reintegrate that difficult material, kind of flush through, for lack of a better term, so that that healing process can get jump started. But when we don't do that, and it's like layer upon layer and upon layer of, we call it like little traumas, cumulative are, are more difficult to treat along with and this is this, I was just talking with our team on Monday at our team meeting, that the most difficult traumas that I treat are not physical and sexual abuse, but that of neglect. And they all agreed with, because I was like, you guys, it's just this, this sense of they can be provided for and have resources, but this sense of neglect and they didn't have feel seen. And, and that goes back to the attachment figure. Um, and they didn't, weren't able to connect with themselves and their own sense of internal leadership. You said so many good things. I think what's really interesting is because, you know, we both work in the body image. Like I work specifically with people fighting on food and body image is tied into that and eating disorders. And I find that it's often really sensitive people who struggle with this. And Mm -hmm. to your point, it's not about what happened to you. It's about how sensitive in a way your system Mm -hmm. is. That's part of maybe that this puzzle piece of why It seems to really conscientious, perfectionist. I'm not saying it's the only reason people struggle with food, but it's definitely a thread there is that their system. Yeah. And and food is one of the few things we can control. I mean, there really isn't much control we have, but we can control how we feed ourselves, how we move, how we rest, how we talk to ourselves. (laughs) We really, if we really get honest, there isn't much agency. We have agency to try and do things in the world, but with the end game, we get to, there's, that's very little, if you know, and so. The agency um, is in how we react. <laughs> that's the choice we get. <laughs> yeah. And so, but, but when everything else feels out of control, we can go to those things. Those are known things. And so what is failing? I remember when I first started, I was still interning and I was working on my certified eating disorder specialist credential and I was interviewing all of these treatment centers. And I met with the founders of Gurr's book. So they sold it, but they're the incredible folks. And she's in recovery. She wrote one of the first books on bulimia and, you know, was a part of all these eating disorder organ, nonprofit organizations. And I'm all starry eyed. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you've been around so long. What's changed? What have you seen? And she goes, nothing. <laughs> and I felt my heart sink. And I, I, I unpacked that a little bit more. And she's just like, no, we, we're throwing spaghetti on the wall. We still are trying to figure out all these different theories and modalities. But if we're and the reality, when I realized as I dug deeper into trauma, if we're not getting to the heart of the stories, that their systems are holding and help their systems tolerate difficult emotions and build emotional literacy and unburden the traumas their systems are holding. So they don't have to numb. They don't have to disconnect. Nothing else works. Yes, we need to learn about how to feed ourselves well. Some people haven't had, had, didn't learn that. I grew up in the Midwest. You know, my vegetable was iceberg lettuce with blue cheese. That's just how we roll in the Midwest. And I still love my blue cheese, but I do different greens now. <laughs> but I digress. And it was like watery iceberg lettuce. So if there's any Midwestern people on the cast, podcast, they'll understand. And so there is an education element, but I mean, with the internet, we, we all can like WebMD food, you know, where there's like all these different mindsets and we try to heal our pain with the easier thing. And then having worked in advertising and politics and understanding the power of using fear and scarcity mindset to get people to take action, we absorb that. I mean, Ali, you and I, we're on the, we're on the front lines helping people re-educate their relationship with food and media literacy, but even we still have to catch ourselves, right? I mean, there's little things that sneak in like, wait, that was a good marketing piece. In 10 days, I could do that. I mean, there's some good marketing out there. And so if someone's in pain and their system is overloaded and flooded, like the thought of two to three years in doing some trauma work, or a 10-day plan. I mean, let's be real. They're going to collect data. And the danger is when people collect the data and try some of these quicker fixes, and that's why I say you're going to go collect data, they sometimes will take them down a path that they'll lose their choices and go down a path with their relationship with food and their body to the point where then it's hijacked their life. And so they've got trauma and their body's not fed well and nourished well. And it's just, you know, it's a cluster there. Well, and so much of my work is around doing experiments so that my clients see they can trust their bodies because part of what trauma does is it makes you not trust, right? At first, it's not trusting the outside world, but if you don't heal that, then it 
almost starts to turn on yourself. And, and, and then the neglect that you experience then becomes the neglect that you internalize in a way. And that's, I think it's, it's not only the great marketing, but it's preying on the fear and the decades of not trusting ourselves. And it's like, oh, this is yes. a salve. This they're is a ca- Yeah, they're counting on that. It, it, the great marketing is counting on that. They're speaking that pain. And I, I feel like it's absolutely crucial. There's so much shame around claiming our traumas and our hurts and our woundedness because we got to have it all together. And yet when we hear someone in a healthy, boundaried way share their story of struggle, that empowers us to be more courageous and to share a story or to ask for help and to dig deeper. And there's this myth that you like fix your trauma and you're done. And, and here's the thing is, depending on the nature of the trauma and how it impacted your system. Okay, I'm going to say this and then have a caveat. It's, it's, it's a part of your story forever. It doesn't have to run your present and your future though. And there may be tender spots and vulnerable areas that you have to circle back to. But there's this narrative in our culture of deal with it, let it go, move on, suck it up, don't be weak, don't be a victim, move past that. And the thing with trauma, you absolutely 100% cannot just think yourself through it. And we try that. Our brains love certainty. And they, if there is something we can hold on to, but trauma treatment and doing your own work and feeling the feelings is uncertainty and it's vulnerable. But if we can expand our tolerance of vulnerability, which is risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure, as Brene Brown defines it, that's the work. And there isn't like a three-step plan. And it really is also we can help heal our brain. But then what I find with my clients too, then our bodies are still holding on to stuff too. So yeah, and food, it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's fun, it's medicine, it's pleasure, and it's joy. And we're in a culture that says, let's just get rid of a food group. Let's just say, I can never do this again. And we white knuckle our relationship with food in a way to try and disconnect from our pains and our traumas. But it really is a courageous act is it's not about the food, but it is. It is in the sense we need food to live. But it really isn't. So this is what you're learning to, leading to in this conversation. With uh, at the heart of it is our traumas and difficult life experiences. Yeah, I love that you said stories because a big part of my work is tra- is is transforming the story and the narrative mm. and looking at while we would never choose these traumatic things to happen to us, they did birth in us certain capacities and certain values. Right? That like to your point, if you get rid of that, you also get rid of the wisdom. And I'm not. And I don't want to dismiss the or say, oh, everything happens for a reason. Because I think you actually, to uh-huh. heal, you have to make a reason. <laughs> That's kind of my guiding philosophy. But what I, I'm always like, trying to like, again, compassionately remind clients when they're like, why did I do this again? I'm like, this is your nervous system. This is not a logic game. This is something that right. we have to calm your nervous system down. We have to expand capacity for discomfort and realize it's not going to have the same outcome as before, and that it is such a process. And food, unfortunately, can really numb us out to that discomfort, right? So it's like... It it serves a purpose. We survive. People survive because of how they restrict or emotionally fuel their bodies. It is. And I think we look at those parts of us as the enemy and we want to get rid of them instead of really getting curious about the parts of us that have a really restrictive or more an emotional or binging or orthorexic, all or nothing, whatever those parts may be, we have to understand they're just trying to protect. And if we look at those parts with compassion, that is a really fundamental shift instead of like, we got to get rid of it. I just came off a call with a client who, you know, I call it your inner protector. And she's like, I'm now realizing all these years that I referred to as my quote, inner Nazi was not someone who was like, I thought, or my inner critic or my inner rebel, right? I hear clients being like, oh, I have this inner food rebel. And Certain coaches encourage that. And I'm like, that even those names makes you distrust yourself. Like, oh, I have this side of me that doesn't want to do what, well, what I intend. And, and the work I've been doing with internal family systems has been a fundamental game changer in that arena. And that these parts had t- took these protectors, the inner critic, the inner food Nazi, or however you know, your clients name them. That doesn't really matter to me as how those parts get to build a relationship with my clients. And they get to unburden because we're not born with an inner food Nazi. You know, those parts of our parts of our internal multiplicity, internal system. That's not how, but you know, life happens. And these protectors that care about us and want us to be safe, all they're doing is trying to help. And that's where the work that you do helps people kind of 
give some space from them, help them come from a place of more calm and clarity and confidence. And if we can unburden those traumas and those wounds and those heavy emotions, you know, that's the work. It's not counting calories. It's not weighing ourselves and having, getting a sticker. It's not, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, Ali, though, I started off giving these talks like, diets don't work, so don't do them. And I thought, yay, guess what? Here's the research. And then people would look at me and nod, and then like they would like not come to future talks because they're like, no, I really want to do this. Because I was like, but the research says. And I was like, I can't even play, I'm saying this publicly, but I think I was like the 0.5% of the world that when Nancy Reagan said, don't do drugs, I was like, okay, you know, the, this is your brain on drugs. Like that made a difference on me, like not most everybody else. So like these kind of like, oh, here's the research. <laughs> I think that was my per- perfectionistic <laughs> parts following on that and kind of confused that why would we know the body of research that diets don't work? So then we see the diet industry change in the language to lifestyles, Right. And this isn't a diet. This is a lifestyle. This is a movement. This is a way of living. And that's marketing too, but it's a lot softer because some people are realizing, wow, that the, 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 the data is huge, that a very, very small segment of the population, do, do they work? And even then, it's not living. Right. Well, I try to get my clients to see that like diets, why you don't realize it, why you, they're still attractive is because they're a form of safety, a, a temporary safety of like, oh, I don't have to figure this out. Like totally. someone else is get, telling me what to do and they must know because inherently if we've experienced trauma or if we've struggled with eating and food, we internalize something's wrong with us, right? So it's like, Mm -hmm. what am I not getting? Like, I can't trust myself. Like, you must know. And I want to kind of circle back. You had talked about, like, you had mentioned briefly different type of eating issues. And how are you defining disordered eating? Because I think being anorexic or bulimic is actually a very small, last time I checked, it was like 3% of the population. Mm -hmm. Yet, Um, is it growing? I well, a binge eating is a little higher, but honestly, I think those numbers are so underreported. And there's certain vulnerable, especially other populations too, whether it's people of color, LGBTQ, there's just so much that we're not catching in really measuring that data. But I really talk about the disorder eating spectrum because you talk if, about you, that? if you claim like, so, oh, I'm not anorexic, I'm not bulimic, you know, and the DSM diagnosis, I mean, it's beneficial if my clients want to use their out-of-network insurance, you know, and, and I can ethically check that box based on our treatment plan. But really, it's kind of this one spectrum is body image. And we say, you know, it's the first to come and the last to go. It's our relationship with our body. And so that's usually the residual. I suspect you deal with a lot of your clients too. It's that shaking that, that just takes time. You know, you've been doing, we're, we're taught to be at war with our bodies. I mean, shoot, Allie, my daughter, she was feeling spooked in the shower last night. So she's like, come be with me. So I'm sitting in there and I look at her in the shower and she's body checking, like sticking her stomach out. And I mean, she's going to be turning 10. I was like, why are you body checking? She's like, oh, but mom, look how fascinating my body is and how I can move it. And I was like, okay. (laughs) Or maybe she was just covering because she knows what I do for a living. But I mean, she's very aware of her body and who's different and who's alike. But for the spectrum, so we got the body image. And here's the thing. I am hard pressed to find a human being who doesn't have at least a bad body image day, week, month, year <laughs> ongoing. So I think there's, there's times that we maybe will tap into that, right? There's some folks who are like, oh, whether it's, oh, my period, I feel bloated, or, oh, I've been sick. I feel I've been able to work out. I feed well. I feel out of sorts. I don't like what I'm seeing or what I'm feeling. So there's like the ish, two more chronic, obsessive, you know, and then it goes into how we feed and our relationship with how we feed our connections with hunger and fullness and eating for joy and pleasure and fuel and medicine, eliminating food groups and all sugar is bad and all gluten is bad. And, you know, we'll have an air sandwich is what is allowed. And then, you know, you've got where your life starts getting smaller and you can't go to places because of the food that's eating or you you can't get to the bathroom or you don't have the energy or there's not a gym nearby or you're not gonna be able to work out right away. And there's So all then it starts to consume how you do life, and this and I work with a lot of elite athletes, and this is a tricky nuance, right? Where they're training and they have to watch this stuff a lot, but when they get injured, we get to see if there's undealt with traumas because it comes up like you know a geyser, and then you've got more of the then you kind of fall into the clinical, you know, and at the at that end, 
But honestly, I kind of just look at it. It's just figuring out where we are and it's kind of normalizing. It's not about getting rid of body image. It's how we respond. Like you touched on the agency of how we respond to our hurts. It's building emotional literacy and it's, it's kind of healing and redefining our relationship with food and movement. And what's tricky is, is even working with leaders and organizations and schools, it's really hard because we want to like have this top down, like my, my daughter's school, they'll talk about how sugar is horrible and, you know, fat's bad. And I get to kind of say, oh no, this cushion on my hips, this is protective because when I fall, my, these hips are not have less likely to break. So I'm going to live longer. And Hazel's like, oh, really? So yeah, you know, and so it, it really is like this. And so most people hang out in that kind of body image to good food, bad food, you know, don't eat, you know, kind of restrict, numb out versus this like eating. It's, there's not a lot of joy and we obsess about it and we disconnect from it. But at the heart of it is we're disconnecting from these difficult emotions shame and fear and pain and loneliness and despair and grief and loss, betrayal. And this is the stuff. And if someone's literally in PTSD or acute stress response, I mean, getting someone to feed well, let alone sleep well is difficult. But in, you know, from a leadership perspective, it's really redefining how we even talk about that. So like your voice is so crucial, Ali, in this arena. And to normalize that these are struggles because anyone who lives in Western culture it's going to have a bad body image day. At least we get to say how to respond to it. You know, it's not going to, we're going to feel off. We're going to feel icky. And people expect eating disorder therapists to like, you know, I'm like, no, there's some days I'm like, oh, this is not my game day. But how I respond to that is different than I did when I was an early 20 something. So the spectrum, as I really look at, and the body image piece really hangs around a lot, especially if someone danced in more of that clinical arena or more of the entrenched. And I don't really care what the label is, is if, it, if your awake time is predominantly occupied by around food or exercise, diets or not feeling like if you got something in that didn't feel clean, you got to get it out and talking about food all the time or who's pretty, who's not scanning Instagram and you know, all that stuff. Yeah, that, that's, that's there. And a lot of us fall on that and we don't even know because we think, oh, I'm not in the throes of a, you know, someone who ends up on the cover of People magazine where they've just done a horrible job representing, you know, disordered eating. It's just this extreme, someone who carries an immense amount of weight versus someone who's just a shell, shell and bones. And those are extremes and they're dangerous. And, and eating disorders are the most deadly of all mental health struggles, usually through suicide and heart attack. <sighs> And, but really most people are living maimed, maimed physically, whether they've done some damage to their body, their bones, their muscles, their brain, or maimed emotionally because they haven't dealt with the trauma. And again, difficult life experiences. Cause we can say why that does, that wasn't that big of a deal. Says our executive functioning, our prefrontal cortex, that wasn't that big of a deal. But when we kind of get curious about it, we realize that, wow, to a five-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old, it was to that part. And then that part overwhelms the system at any threat of that feeling again. Well, and this brings up this bigger piece of, I always tell my clients, like the healthier you get, the more you realize how emotionally unwell our culture is, right? Because we're like, well, this person is like, but it's not this, or I just want to move on or because that's what the culture tells us. And until you can really get out of the matrix and say, whoa, I'm actually not living in a very emotionally stable or healthy culture either. So right. why am I looking at what is quote unquote normal? Because normal is not working out so well. Um, oh yeah. I am like a weirdo. Like when I work out at the gym or in my classes and I listen to all my friends, friends and every now and then I'll be like, or you could just not weigh yourself this week. And then I get like the death stares and then I zip it again. But I, yeah, no, you're right. And it's so homeostasis, diet culture, body shaming, all or nothing, good food, bad food, all um, orthorexia, obsession with eating healthy in the name of health. All of that is homeostasis in our culture. It's a $65 billion, I think that's the last study I saw anywhere between 55 and $65 billion a year in America alone industry, including diets, diet related services, supplement, you know, all that stuff. That, and it's in um, healthcare too. I've had so many clients who <laughs> they, like they come to me after their doctor is like, you need to lose weight. You need to move more, eat less, try Nutrisystem. And they're like, what? <laughs> so... Yeah. And so this is the thing, um, Dr. Holt, who's on the team at Potentia, she's amazing. 
when she was at Loma Linda, which is a blue zone. Um, Dr. Dean Ornish talks about these blue zones in our country and it's a seventh day Advent culture. So that's a little yeah. bit how their, their meal plan is. And she learned that, and I have dear, I have doctors in the family. I have doctor friends, so this isn't personal, but the profession as a whole knows the least amount of nutrition out of all the wellness professionals, the traditional ones out there. And so that's why working with someone like Megan, who has expertise in the disorder eating spectrum is crucial in the terms of the ethics too, of anyone working on these issues to work with a team of people who have expertise in that area. And often the doctor, <laughs> finding a doctor who has that mindset, because to me, the BMI is 100% a marketing tool. It is not a health marker at all. It's a fabulous marketing, marketing tool. So I'll, I'll have doctors who, you know, clients will come, I'm like, you know, your doctor is doing the best she or he can. That's what they know. Unintentionally, they're kind of fueling the parts of you that want to binge, want to restrict or feeling shame. So we try and do education, but that's really what they know. And they also are seeing, there's a lot of burnout. I gave a talk to about 300 family physicians on shame, resilience, and empathy and compassion because they have this burnout towards the population who are not complying, have late onset diabetes, and just aren't taking care of themselves and just feeling frustrated and kind of giving up on those patients. And the reality is, is these folks are traumatized and they're getting re-traumatized by you when they get shamed, like, what? You didn't do this? And it's blowing them off. Where it really is this epidemic of disconnection, an epidemic of numbing and it, exhausted of feeling the traumas out there. They're, and again, you're so right, Rally. Our homeostasis really is the disorder eating spectrum. Um, I can't believe I just said that publicly. So, um, I mean, I, I'm saying that just because I'm thinking of all my friends who have different food philosophies or workout philosophies that I love dearly. But I, I feel like, you know, when our identity gets so wrapped and our worth is so wrapped up in that, but safety is with someone who's undealt with trauma for years, safety is, is crucial. And we can't think our way through. We have to feel our way through the healing and help our brain, our body unburden the pain and build up confidence and resilience that we can feel rejection, feel disappointment, get triggered by shame, but it doesn't have to take us to the dark pit of despair again. And that's the work. And the, sometimes that's long, nuanced work. And I'm so grateful you're a voice for many people on their path to healing to help them kind of ground themselves and stop the spinning and get curious about that deeper work that, you know, help them even get to a place where they're able to do that and curious enough and stable enough to go, okay, what's next? And that's really cool. I appreciate that about you. Well, I appreciate that about your work too. It's like, let's get real here, right? And <laughs> I think part of the, what you're calling homeostasis, I'm calling normalization. The challenge is we hear in our culture that is not so well, don't be a victim, right? <laughs> and that mindset. And I want to really talk about, and I think none of us like to think of ourselves as victim, but we can be victimized. And I want to talk about the, the difference between that, especially in our, you know, around the time we're recording this, there's been this viral video, I, at least in my world, it's been viral, of Tony Robbins, who, again, people who tend to be in health and wellness also kind of overlaps with personal development because it's just <laughs> it kind does. of the same thing sometimes. Um, it's all about vitality, right? And he is thought of as this, like, you know, leader because he's, I don't know, Oprah ordained him or whatever. I don't know. I don't really, I've never really followed his work because there just something wasn't in alignment for me. But the clip that went viral was basically this woman asking about Me Too and him basically saying, you're being a victim. And I want you to kind of break down, what's the difference between being victimized and not having a victim state and having to own that we what? have been wounded? I mean, we as a culture, just first to say, there isn't permission to have face down moments. There isn't permission to struggle. There isn't permission to bring the messy. I mean, we see a lot of people trying to in encourage that, but there's still these narratives out there. So with that said, if someone has been violated and perpetrated, betrayed, abused, hurt, whatever those words um, best identify, then if we, there's like this sense of, we want to rush through that process because we don't want to claim any of that because we're afraid of being misunderstood as weak, as not capable, as not strong, as not credible. So the statistics with trauma, particularly abuse, physical and sexual abuse, neglect on that spectrum, 
I mean, and even being exposed to th- kids being exposed to things they shouldn't be exposed to, or women being harassed in the workplace, on, on the streets, <laughs> in public transportation, we're, we're, the statistics are off the chart. It's hard to find someone who hasn't been touched by those boundary crossings or impacted by those boundary crossings. And so to say, yeah, I've had experiences where I've been violated and I have been abused and abuse is a part of my story and sexism being discriminated against being objectified. Yes. I I mean, just like body image, I'm hard pressed to find a woman in particular who hasn't experienced that. So does that mean I'm a victim? And I've heard different people talk about, oh, I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. Whatever works for my clients, for the people I'm consulting with, I'm not wedded in that. But there are people that have a hard time, and you talked about victim mindset that gets shamed a lot by the some of these quick fix, don't think about the past personal development folks like Tony Robbins. And then we're just shaming our story. And we can't, I mean, I'm right-handed. So... I'm just going to go ahead and cut off my left hand because I don't need it. No, I still need it. It's, you know, it's crucial. So yeah, the difficult parts of my story, I can't edit them, you know, and, but we can numb and detach from them. And so when we don't have permission, but here's, this is, this is a big point though. And this is what working with Brene and her community and digging into her research has really taught me is if like you and I could probably jam for days, right? I mean, we could just go and (laughs) go deep we could we could up and down in and we could that would be easy you know and and from what I know of your story you've done a lot of your own work and you have been through a lot you are a survivor mind body and soul and some people are at different places in that journey you remember your face down moments you remember those like questioning moments and the extreme loneliness and despair and the pain emotionally and even physically you weren't excited to go hey everybody Here's here's my ish. Why, why were why were you not excited to go share all your ish at that time? Because you were afraid of being misunderstood, rejected, people not seeing you a certain way, it feeling worse. I mean, and I didn't even understand it fully myself. You didn't have the the language. Okay, yeah, even that. But we know that it's not okay to struggle. And I think more and more people are loving. They're like, okay, they're, we're, what I, we're at a culture where we can at least Instagram quotes that it's okay to struggle. So we're, we're taking it there. And now the next level is living that. And it's brutal. Like if you are vulnerable, you are not smiling. <laughs> you are not like, hey, I was so vulnerable. You know, no, it was, it's terrifying. But you ha- you're aligned with what matters most. You're putting yourself out there. You're saying, I need help. This isn't okay. Stop not okay. I'm going to keep. And so like the woman in the video who kept circling back with Tony, it was beautiful to watch like, Hey, I really do value you. At the same time, I think you're off the mark here because this is what's important. And he kept rejecting and pushing back. And that was a dialogue. She didn't shrink. She didn't puff up. She stood her sacred ground. I don't know her story, but victim mindset means I don't have a voice. My story doesn't matter. I can't share my story. I can't be found out no one's going to love me. I'm never going to succeed. Even some of the Eeyore mentality. And here's the thing, Allie, I'm hard pressed to find someone that hasn't dipped into that. I think that's part of that. We we go down into it and then we got to rise and that's how we learn. But sometimes people also that the mindset of being a victim is safe because if I've got clients of like, if I dare to hope, if I dare to try, I might be disappointed. So it's safer to stay in Eeyore land. And those are hard folks to be around. For long periods of time. So that makes tells me, well, it must be really hard for them to be around themselves too. So if there's been victimhood, again, perpetration, abuse, trauma, boundaries have been crossed verbally, physically, sexually, emotionally, that's different than believing that's the best you can get. And we try and hotwire people in that space and rush them out of it too quickly that we send the message that that's, that part of their story is shameful those feelings, we can't stay there. You can't take it. So we actually perpetuate that mindset. When we do that, just let it go. Just suck it up. Pull up your bootstraps. Think about the present and the future. I joked with you a pre-call. It's like when people say, just let it go and don't think about the past. I'm like, oh, you're asking me to get a lobotomy. Like (laughs) you can't do that. So yes, I feel like if you have had any kind of experience where you've been a victim or perpetrated, you have danced with victim mindset. Some people stay there longer than others. And 
when I see people that really reactive to someone, like if I'm in that place, I'm in just like, I suck, the world sucks, nothing ever good's going to happen. And the person in front of me just gets in my business and just kind of yells at me for being so stuck. I got to let it go. That's not helpful. But if I have someone that loves me and says, man, this isn't the Rebecca I know. What's going on? Oh my gosh, someone really cares. Empathy, compassion, curiosity, sincerity, love. Then I slowly can maybe get out for 10 more minutes out of that and 20. So a real trauma-informed mindset is sometimes a victim mindset is going to hang around. And sometimes those of us that are not in it, we don't want to go back and it can be really triggering for us. Sometimes the victim mindset is more about the people around that person and how they handle someone struggling. Mm-hmm. You know, and because we're not tolerant of struggle, we're not tolerant of trauma and difficult life experiences. We love overcome stories, but we don't like, oh, I'm in it and it sucks. We're like, okay, let me know when you're done. I'll, I'll bring a casserole when you're done. <laughs> you know, and so that's the mindset about trauma. And so then speaking of casseroles, it's like, no, bring the damn casserole now. I need it now. <laughs> and that's where food is our friend. And that's one of the hugest things that the diet culture has done is it robbed the joy of food. And if you've got someone who hasn't felt joy in their life and their system's like, oh, hell to the no, are you going to take away this joy? And that's why I'm like, hey, you can joy on with that. But I can tell you want that one lasagna slice. Great. The whole pan, that's not joy anymore. But the system doesn't know that. And that's the nuance work. We can't think our way through it. We got to feel our way through it. We got to create communities where there's more permission for struggle. But it doesn't mean that we don't have boundaries too. I remember Brene saying, there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. And I was like, what? I made my brain explode. She's like, no, compassion isn't like a pie that you piece out and then it's all gone. If you have compassion fatigue, you're not doing compassion right. So one of her first uh, Courage Camp conferences for all the folks that are certified in her work, she had Kristen Naff speak at the end. Who's oh, done. I love Kristen Naff. Yeah. yeah. And so my, this is where my brain exploded. And I feel like it's really related to this, whether it's someone, what side you're on. So Renee's research found that shame can exist in the presence of empathy. And that's where I connect with the emotion that you're feeling, Allie. So if you're talking about rejection and I tap into feeling what that feels like for me, then shame can exist there. But what Chris and Neff brought home to me and what was crucial is almost like you've got that in in exchange between two people, but almost like this arc above them of self-compassion. So day in and day out, we're sitting with people and their stories of struggle and we're connecting with those emotions. That's brave work. Oh, so today I felt rejection, betrayal, (laughs) forgiveness, grief. I connect with all of that stuff. If I don't check in and practice self-compassion, my empathy can't sustain. My capacity for empathy can't sustain. My capacity for empathy can't sustain. Then shame's going to come in and run the show. And so I feel like it's both and and is someone who's healing to practice the self-compassion. Like my best today was to not have a victim mindset for 10 minutes. (laughs) Okay. My best today was to have a little hope. I mean, not having a victim mindset is like, I'm going to dare to hope that I can love again or be loved or that I can like my body someday, have a healthy relationship and buy 10 minutes. That's what I got today. All right. That's what someone's system is. But then for that person's loved ones to practice self-compassion too, because it's frustrating and painful to see someone you love hurting. And we have no patience for that. We're like, you got to get better soon because it's hurting me too much. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of it's about their need that they can't fix it. And so they feel mm-hmm. powerless, right? It's like, I love your concept though of like victim mindset isn't something that again is fixed and permanent. Like we can go in and out of it because we yep. all have days where we're more depleted. Totally. Yeah. And as you were talking, I was thinking about like that woman was actually like saying, no, I'm not a victim. My voice matters. Like the meta, the meta level of, of, you would have to understand trauma to understand actually she was saying, no, I'm not a victim because I'm standing up to you. Like to me, courage is like speaking truth to power, right? (laughs) Right. By embracing the Me Too movement, it's easy for someone who's perpetuated what Me Too is all about to say, to try and define it. And that just is what it is, right? And yeah, so like that was his story and he was leading with what. Yeah, but that's not his to define. It's not a part right. of his. Story. And so because he wasn't teachable, he wasn't humble, he wasn't curious. It was like, no, I'm going to tell you what this is. And this is my physics of my reality and welcome to my orbit. And 
she stood there and again, I mean, like, what is he like six, 10 or something, seven he's, foot? I don't know. I mean, I'm really short. tall. <laughs> he's something really tall. You know, I mean, I'm used to that because I'm like five, two. So I mean, everyone's really Everybody's tall. tall. I like, even though I don't feel five, two, I sometimes have to get a reality check when I <laughs> trying to catch things in the kitchen shelves and all that. But um, I know I always know my, like, I'm really short when I'm like, I'm trying to reach for the glasses and my arms just won't reach. Well, here's the thing. I will say this, Allie. I feel very strongly. I am Rebecca Ching. I am human. I am woman. I am mother. I am wife. I am friend. I am a seeker of passion and joy. I am curious. I love learning. I have experiences with abuse and rejection and depression and anxiety and shame and failure. And those parts are part of my story, but they're not, they don't define me. And there were times where they consumed me. And I moved through it and I went back into it and I moved through it. I mean, I'll be honest with you, 40s rock. Growing up is legit. I just have to say that. I appreciate that a lot for me and my story. But I, you know, so she's like, I am not a victim. No, I am not a victim. But I am a person who's experienced a lot of things that are different and diverse. But I am Rebecca. And so it's like we try and say, if, hi, I've had this experience in Me Too movement. Oh, you're not a victim. No, I'm not, but I've had this experience. So he was trying to put that on. So just move on. And his whole thing is NLP and the hyperhypnosis stuff that he does. What's you your know, opinion of NLP? I have my own, but I'm curious what you... All right. I'm going to give you my PC opinion because... Oh, and we defined NLP, the neuro, yeah. not just neuro-linguistic programming, but for people out here, because it's important that they're looking for someone who's going to help them, that they know what modalities these people are using. Okay. Here is my standard response to this. There are so many ways to heal. If there was one way to heal, we'd all be learning it, doing it, getting it. Learning from Oprah too, right? <laughs> Oprah would have had it. Well, even though... Ex- I mean, so let's just say that. I mean, whether... That's the thing. That's why the diet industry is $65 billion a year because people keep going from thing to thing to thing. It doesn't stick. And even in mental health, people are frustrated because trauma work is nuanced work. But so there's been a meta research study, at least in the mental health field. And I don't know if there's been anything in the more personal development or consulting, executive coaching type of thing. But the modality of healing is a percentage of it. But what's even more important in the healing relationship is the relationship with the client and the clinician. And what's even more healing is what happens in between the sessions each week has nothing to do with the session. (laughs) So I have a hard time developing um, a lot of respect for certain theories, but I have an immense respect for the consumer's choice to get curious. If someone says, hey, where would you recommend I look? Well, I'm a big believer in internal family systems, Brene shame resilience theory, EMDR therapy, sensory motor psychotherapy, Dan Siegel's interpersonal neurobiology. I'm picky about my somatic experiencing practitioners, but if there's a good one, it's amazing. So I am passionate about mind-body approaches that are trauma-informed, but I want to coach a consultant, a clinician, a mentor who has excellent boundaries, who has done their own work, who is curious, who is humble, who is always learning and is empowering the person in front of them because the client is always the hero, not the practitioner. I love that. That's kind of an amazing ending. (laughs) So you're not going to comment on if you like it or not, but that's just... I talk about what I do like, so hopefully that's an an implied. Yeah. (laughs) But, but, But again, what I look for is the people. And like, I am overwhelmed and humbled with the men and women on the Potentia team now and with the businesses and organizations that I get to work with, with more consulting and and like wholeheartedness. Yeah. I mean, that's the key. And, and people who really want to master something and, and dig in deep. There's a lot of things out there that I feel like because of my lens on IFS and neuroscience and, and again, you know, Brene's work and EMG, I some of these things out there don't feel like they get to the heart of it, but that's my lens. And I trust people. And I know people have reported they've gotten help with some of these things, but maybe it's just for that season, right? Some people start with OA, right? Overeaters Anonymous, where I don't recommend that because it's very calorie focused. It celebrates not eating, you know, and losing weight. Yeah. And not having snacks and not eating intuitively. And I can't tell you, Allie, the number of people that have said, hey, that's where I started. So that Mm -hmm. really spoke to me when I listen to people. I'm like, someone need to start somewhere. But you want to go with people that have high integrity and professional boundaries and who invest in their skill. 
But I mean, I'm passionate about these theories and approaches, but they're not my dogma. They're not my religion. And again, the client is the hero, not me. And we get to be guides, Allie, which is so fun. And then we get to keep doing our own work too, because we're human too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. I, I always think sometimes when my own little biases of NLP type stuff is like, but it could be so much better. Like, I know you think that you've gotten better, but if you do the deeper work, like you can have so much more freedom. <laughs> right, but some people need to go try the diet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and hey, I was there for 18 years. So <laughs> And collect the data, you know, and then but that's and that's the thing, you know, that's why you're so passionate. You're like, I had 18 years of collecting data. I'd like to save you um yeah. <laughs> I want to save people time. (laughs) You know, and what I've learned is I can put the information out there. I can build the relationship and that people will heal at their own pace and not to compare it. And it's hard for folks like us. We see it. We see the train wrecks happening with what's going on in culture and what's being profited, pushed, pushed out there in the name of health. I mean, yes, I was pretty disappointed at Weight Watchers targeting teens from our lens, but you know what? Okay. From a business standpoint, I mean, when you dig into the BMI change and the people that were part of changing the BMI were people on the boards of Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers. So the business model is counting on people coming back and recidivism and all of that. So from a business perspective, it's brilliant. Is it ethical? Hell no, I don't think so. But you know what I hear from people who are pushing back when, you know, a lot of the folks who are in the health and wellness, food and body, disorder eating, treatment community, People were saying, you know what? Weight Watchers was there for me. It was my community. It was my encouragement. So I'm like, see, so people are wanting community. They want relationships. They want connection. They want meeting. They want shared goals. I get that. That's how we're wired. We were wired for belonging. People felt belonging at Weight Watchers. It's people are in permanent deep points detox for the rest of their lives, you know, to some extent. But I, I don't want to shame people who are wanting to try it out. I, I, I just want to say, hey, be careful if you start to feel like this is where you can't get out of it or you're losing choices. But that sense of belonging and community and um, support and a language that everyone understands, I mean, I, I get it. Is it reckless and unethical and dangerous and poor leadership? I agree. I, yes, I do. And business colliding with people's health, um, I feel like it needs to be held to higher standard. I'm not sure what that looks like, but yeah. So yeah, no, I know whenever we like, I do the kickoff, like diagnosing people's story, we look at the good habits that they do have, right? Because no one's come. people tend to feel like, oh, I failed. I'm, nothing is working. I'm like, things can always be worse. And I'm like, I know that y- you can feel frustrated at all your past diet attempts as I did. However, I'm sure you've learned some things along the way. And we look at that stuff. And I, I love that you brought about up belonging and Weight Watchers because I actually take clients through an exercise of like when they felt most alive. And a lot of times people do think of their their Uh thinnest period, but we look at like, where did you have a felt sense of belonging? Like it wasn't that the diet was magical and working. It was that you were being emotionally fed at that time in your life in some way. And so, yeah, we always look at the deeper like emotional solution that that sometimes these things provide. So yeah, we all have to start somewhere and, and go along our path. And so I agree. And there's things to be learned from everything. For sure. We, we're always collecting data and we got to stay curious about that. Even our failures, failures aren't really failures. They're just where we learn and collect data. And I call them research. <laughs> yeah, I got to do some research and a lot of people have to do that. And, and when you give someone permission versus like shut it down, I've learned, I mean, because when I started giving these talks and I'm like, oh, wait, I want to have conversations. So it's really just planting seeds so that they can not spend as much time and their energy and their resources in that arena. But honestly, say, hey, you got to do some trauma work or some deeper soul work. That's just not sexy and not pleasant, not time efficient, not budget friendly, <laughs> all of the above. But I, I think that's where it's at. And I'm well, really and it's, and close I, to that. Yeah. Well, and I think too, my clients will say it was, it's always worth it. Like even though it feels like it's more time intensive and all that stuff to, to be able to live back in your body and to... Oh, game changer. Yeah. Yeah. It's freedom, right? Like can't put a price on freedom, right? Freedom isn't free. (laughs) No. No. And it really is about trusting yourself because we live in a world that says you don't know best we do. And, you know, I love that you're circling people back to their own wisdom, but that takes some time if they've never been taught that. And yeah. So we, we get to just keep dripping the stuff out yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> but I think for everyone, you know, to, to Rebecca's point, next time you feel like you've overeaten or 
fallen off a diet or whatever, you know, don't use it as research, not to say, why am I broken or why am I fixed? But like, what uncertainty is happening here? Where is my nervous system jacked up? Like what triggered this that has really not a lot to do with food and maybe not even to do with the present moment? Yeah. And there's a lot of people to go walk with you on that journey if it's hard to figure that out on your own. Yeah. Yeah. So tell people where they can find you because do you guys do, I know you're based in San Diego, but do you guys do virtual therapy or? Okay. So we are a brick and mortar integrative mental health practice in San Diego, Potentia Family Therapy. Because of the whole licensing thing, we work only with people in the state of California, but, and through my work with RebeccaChing.com, where I do higher, I don't do as much, it's more like working on internal family systems and Brene's research through helping business leaders and entrepreneurs in that arena. And so I do do consultations. It's not related to mental health therapy, but we're going to be launching some really cool stuff, some cool content. We're going to be developing an orthorexia workshop. We're doing it in person. We're going to take that online, hopefully early 2019, if not by the end of this year. We're going to do a couple pilots then and orthorexia is one of our passion topics, the obsession of eating healthy, which is I think headquartered in San Diego, California, but (laughs) definitely not limited to it. You guys can't hide in sweaters like we can on the East Coast. (laughs) And, you know, we do webinars and we're going to be getting some new content going soon. So you can definitely join our mailing list on our website at potentiatherapy.com or follow us on Instagram at potentiatherapy, or you can follow me at Rebecca Ching, MFT. So yeah, those are some places to stay connected for sure. Wonderful. And we will have on my website, alishapiro.com backslash podcast, we will have all of Rebecca's contact information and, and et cetera. So thank you so much for talking trauma and really clarifying so much about, oh, I learned so much. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Ali. And thanks for all you do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? Find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real, and liberating. Thank you.